On today's show, we speak with a distinguished professor of communications at the highly esteemed Carnegie Mellon University on the topic of storytelling, which is recognized as an important component to a successful advocates meeting with elected officials. Stay tuned as we learn more. Participate, engage, speak out, use your voice to be an effective advocate. The Voices in Advocacy podcast examines the diverse landscape of advocacy, exploring the ins and outs of building influence, driving change, and creating champion advocates. It's now time for the Voices in Advocacy podcast with your host, Roger Rickard. Hello and welcome to season four of the Voices in Advocacy podcast. I'm Roger Rickard, president and founder of Voices in Advocacy, where we work with organizations to inspire, educate, engage, and activate your supporters by turning them into effective, influential advocates. And this is the podcast dedicated to the art of advocacy. This podcast is for the people that work and engage in advocacy efforts for their organizations, be they corporations, associations, trade organizations, and nonprofit cause groups. Now, let's get started. On today's show, we speak with Professor Ed Barr, communications coach for select master's students at Carnegie Mellon University located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Ed has an extensive background in communications, marketing, and writing skills, literally just to name a few. He has also taught at the Heinz College of Public Policy and Management at Carnegie Mellon University. He is the author of 101 Tips for Improving Your Business Communication and two additional books on communications, marketing, and job search. Uh, Most importantly now, he was a teacher to me. Also, we go way back having worked together on a few political campaigns. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome my friend and teacher, Professor Ed Barr, to today's show. Welcome, Ed. Roger, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be with you because I've been following you, as you know, on LinkedIn, Facebook, all over social media. What you're doing is fantastic. It's of such great value to people, not just in America, but around the world as we look at how things are unfolding these days. So so really, I'm I'm honored to be with you. Oh, Ed, the pleasure, the pleasure is reciprocated, believe me. I uh... I'm grateful for uh, our friendship and I'm grateful for uh, the path that we've gone down and particularly for you and the exciting, great work that you do at Carnegie Mellon University. During the the lead in for the show today, I said that we are going to discuss storytelling in the context of advocacy meetings with elected officials. Let's start at the beginning. Why is storytelling a powerful tool in communicating? Well, it all goes back to the way the human brain functions. So we have these, we have these places in our brain that that are very able to synthesize facts and numbers. And they isolate them, they accept them, they try to understand them, and then they just store them away, or they throw them away. But stories have a whole different interaction in our brains. And when we understand how our brains function, we can really communicate much better. And certainly storytelling is a part of that. So these days, just about every corporation out there is turning its attention to storytelling. And we have people like Seth Godin say, if you are not telling stories, you're going to become irrelevant. So I've had a couple organizations reach out to me recently to say, can you help us understand a little bit more about storytelling. So it's on everybody's mind, literally. And it's something that can be of great, great value to any organization and any advocate. We tend to remember stories better, don't we? We do. We do because of many reasons. One reason has to do with what's called theory of mind. So we have this capability as humans that other forms of life don't have. And that is we're able to understand what somebody else is thinking most of the time. 
And that, of course, is related to something called empathy. And all of this has to do with some chemicals that are going on in our, in our brains that are, have uh, names like oxytocin and dopamine and uh, vasopressin and you know, some other kind of jargon that I'm, I'm not going to lean on here. But, but we do know this about oxytocin, that it, that it makes us relax, it puts us at ease, and it makes us more receptive it's, it's, it has the, the name, whether it's right or, or not, the, the kind of love, the love drug. So, so when that's happening in our brains, it's different from what's happening when we're trying to receive facts and figures. You know, there's, there's a great quote that I'd like to share with you, and that is by a guy named Goodman. He said that numbers numb and jargon jars and nobody ever marched on Washington because of a pie chart. So, so you know, what they march on is a, a story and about a story. And I was fascinated, as I said earlier to you, to listen to Julie Walker and this incredible story that she told. You said it, it made your hair stand up and, and it did the same thing to me because of many different reasons and, and techniques that are that are vital to storytelling so so those stories are definitely the way to go and yeah if you go out if you go out to Barnes and Noble you're going to see you're going to see lots of books on storytelling yeah yeah and and referencing the, the Julie Walker just for the audience that was on a previous uh uh, episode of the show and I encourage anybody to go back and and take a listen to that because uh I, would, I had chills and I actually forced back uh, uh, the tears because uh, of her ability to communicate so effectively what was going on in her life at that time. So, you know, uh, I don't know if you or your audience is familiar with a book called Significant Objects. It was written by another guy, another person rather named Walker, Rob Walker, who was, a, was still is perhaps a reporter for the New York Times. This guy and another fellow decided to prove how powerful storytelling is in this way. They went to thrift stores and bought these items that averaged, I think, $1.25 each. And then they asked 200 famous writers to write a story about the object that, that they gave them. And then they sold those objects for $8,000. So... So they were able to prove that you can increase value simply by telling a story. Interesting. Uh, I'll have to get that and we'll put that in show notes uh, for people if they have an interest in that. You know, I have always been told that a great story kind of has three elements and you can contradict that uh, if you'd like, uh, but they are, what do you want your audience to know? What do you want them to feel? And what do you want them to do? Uh, what are your thoughts on these three elements? Uh, well, they are three important elements, certainly. You know, when you look at, when you look at models for storytelling, the, 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 probably the most common one, the, the typical one, the usual one, at least in colleges, is Freitag. It has the, uh, the introduction, the rising action, the climax, the uh, falling action, denouement, or the resolution, and then the conclusion. And it's, it's really kind of Aristotelian. And when you think about ethos and pathos and logos, and these things all kind of fit together. But I, I read this, this incredible definition of story, and that is things get bad, they get worse, they get worse. And then in the end, they get better. So, so you know, one of the things about stories uh, is that they have to have conflict. They have to have tension. They have to have obstacles. I'm coaching or students. I'm sorry. Or a villain. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Villains are critical. So I'm, I'm telling students all the time that, that they have to tell a story when they go on an interview. Or they have to use storytelling when they go on their internships in Wall Street. And they're all saying, typically, I don't have a story. I, I don't know what you're talking about. 
but they all do. We all do. And, and we're seeing a story play out right now, unfortunately, in Europe. And I don't want to date this, this podcast, but we know what's happening in Ukraine. And we know that it's a war of competing stories, literally. So one side will have you believe their story, and the other side wants you to believe theirs. So we, we look at it from our different perspectives, and we find a villain, as you just suggested. And then we believe or we adhere to that story. It's very emotional. So Tolstoy said that art is uh, an emotional infection. And what stories do um, is they compete. They, they put us in competition. So you have a Ukrainian story that's competing with a Russian story at the moment. And this is what stories do, of course. They are very powerful uh, as a persuasion tool. So, so what, what stories do is dramatize and, and what, what everybody else is trying to do is rationalize. So, so this dramatization, when it, when it uses the right technique is just incredibly powerful. Yeah, absolutely. Is there, and I think you laid it out a little bit, is there a process you would recommend in developing effective stories? Well, yes. The other thing that I didn't mention is change. So our brains are prediction machines. And what happens to us is that we are coasting along. Our brains use 20% of our oxygen, 20% of our, of our uh, glucose and they're very expensive machines. And mostly what they are doing under the hood is keeping us alive, regulating our heartbeat, regulating our, our respiration and doing all the functions constantly 24 hours a day that, that we don't do consciously. So, so when this is happening, we, we mostly try to ignore everything because we want to save the energy that we're using in our brains to allow us to stay alive. And what happens is that we must then be distracted. We must then, our, our um, attention needs to be violated. Our expectations need to be violated. So the best way to understand story is to understand that something has to change. Something must change and it's all about action and so you can, you can begin a story by saying, uh, I walked out the door and shut the door, locked the door. And when I was outside, I realized I forgot my bus pass. Well, something's going to happen now. So, so I mean, that's a very simple example, of course, but, but this, is, this is what makes story work. The fact that, that something has to change in our brains will ignore everything unless there's, there's some distraction, disruption, because we are so overwhelmed with clutter and noise in, in this environment. You know, uh, I was gonna ask you about that. Uh, we were, were bombarded all the time, if you will, with so much information uh, that is out there that it's sometimes hard to get and retain the focus of your audience, and even if that's one-on-one, -on -one, how do we retain that focus in those encounters? If that happens, do you have any solutions for people? Well, it, it, it again goes back to the word change, and I've subscribed now to the notion that when I'm teaching, I have to change every 10 minutes or they're gone. Uh, there was a study at Washington University, I think, in St. Louis that said that it was 15 minutes, but you know, I keep reading about this stuff all the time, and, and I'm now convinced it's more like 10 minutes. So, so change is critical. Disruption is critical. Changing action is critical. Regardless of what you have to do, if, if you are in a meeting with a legislator or if you're in a session, something has to change in 10 minutes or they go blank. You know, we receive 11 million bits of information per second. 11 million bits of information per second, but we are only consciously aware of 40. <laughs> Imagine that. Now, 
most of that information, those bits of information are coming through our eyes and it goes in, it perhaps sits somewhere in our long-term memory or short-term memory. But this constant bombardment of three to 5,000 commercial messages every day, everywhere you turn, we just shut it off. And so we're all in that state of, I don't want to pay attention to this unless there's action. So I like to say, okay, you walked out of your office, Roger, and it was late at night and your, your car was parked over there, um, you know, 200 feet away. And there's this one street light on and you're walking toward your car and out of the corner of your eye, you see this shadow. Well, right away, you were on automatic pilot to go to your car. But when you saw that shadow, you, you were aware of something. And then you heard a voice and it said, hey, Roger, it's me, Ed. And, and right away, the, all, all the defenses went down and you're back on automatic pilot. So, so we have to find ways to do that kind of thing to each other's brains. And, you know, there, there are lots of ways to do it, of course. They're, they're, as, they're as plentiful as your imagination. What do you do to make someone come back on track? Well, it could be just about anything, really. Yeah. Yeah. You create some sort of a change, though, because you've got to get their attention back. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and it makes me think that as, as a professional speaker in my role, a storyteller, an advocate, we're, we're trained an awful lot to focus on benefits to an audience. Right. Exactly. Elected officials always want to know uh, what you're advocating for. How does that affect their constituents? Do you have any suggestions on how to translate what would benefit you into benefiting a broader constituency? Is there a way that you can ask them questions? Because I, I know you're so good at framing questions. Is there a way that you can ask those questions that uh, can try to get to that? Well, I'm constantly preaching in class that we need to use what, why, and how questions. So we do that, of course, and you know this very well because it's going to, create a conversation is going to create a longer answer. And if we ask the other questions, the who, when, and where, we're going to get a one word answer. So the other thing that I'm constantly preaching is the use of the word you. So, I mean, it seems so simple, but it's so fundamental. So I'll say to my students, okay, how many of you raise your hand if your cover letter starts with the word I? And of course they all raise their hands, because it does. And I'm constantly saying, look, you need to think outside in, outside in. Or as you said, Roger, what are the benefits? What's in it for me? What do I get out of this? And we never tire of hearing our names or the word you, unless, of course, there's some threat behind it. And uh, those things really never work. So, so yeah. So, Audience understanding is the most fundamental thing. And you quoted, you quoted Peter Drucker when we uh, began talking earlier. Yeah, uh, it reminds me of, uh, of a speaker coach that I had who was a Hall of Fame speaker. And his whole theory was, you got to get them on the bus. And how do you get them on the bus? You get them on the bus by talking about them. Oh, absolutely true. Absolutely true. So I have this little, uh, I have this little uh, practice that I do in class. So I, I, I say, okay, this young man and this young woman, I, I want you to say to her, I am handsome, I am wonderful, I am talented. And then I say to her, how did that make you feel? And she said, well, I think he's arrogant. So then I say, and this is a lot of fun in class, Okay, now tell her you are beautiful, you are intelligent, you are wonderful. How how did that make you feel? And she always said, "Wow, that made me feel great." Yeah, and and, and that's the point. Uh, you know, you get away from I and you get to you. And I I've been taught that uh, for every time I say I in a speech, I should be saying you uh, at least ten times. Exactly. Yes. You're yeah. Exactly right. Right. Yeah. In one of your books, and I'm not, I can't remember which one, 
Uh, you wrote that the recipient is the communicator. We were talking about the Peter Drucker thing. Talk to us a little bit about what that notion is. Wow. So let me read a, a, a quote to you that I just happen to have right here. And I think it's, it's related to, to this question. If you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood and don't assign them tasks and work, but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. So, so when we're trying to persuade people, we're trying to give them a vision. Uh, I'll tell you a book that, that turned me around. It's, it, it's called Pitch Anything by a guy named Oren Clough. When I read that book, I had this moment and I said, wow, this guy really knows what he's talking about. And he talks about wanting to build an airport somewhere in California and telling a story about the people who lived in the land there and how that story then helped them raise all uh, lots of venture capital. So again, it's just back to how do you touch somebody emotionally? When you're able to touch them emotionally, of course, then you really have your hooks in them. You know, sorry to put it that way, but but you re you really got them. Then, if as Julie Walker had both you and me at her at her knees, really because of that terribly emotional story. Yeah, you know, in organizations and whether they're corporations or whether they're associations, they talk about vision, but they talk about vision inward looking, rather in rather than in most cases, talking about vision outward looking right. so that they can bring other people on with them. And I know that that's changing out there. Would you agree with that? Absolutely, yes, absolutely. So, so the big word, of course, now in the uh, business community is purpose. And we keep hearing that all the research saying that uh, Gen Z is only going to work somewhere where they understand the purpose of the organization the organization understands that purpose. So, so there's a whole uh, cottage industry now of consultants who are purpose consultants to, to, to help you, you know, look at your vision. I had the good fortune of working for the Sisters of Mercy who, who opened the first Mercy Hospital in the world in Pittsburgh, PA. And their mission was to create a healthy community. Now, you know, that's something that you can probably never achieve because you have to stop people from smoking, from gaslighting, from, you know, all kinds of things in addition to just being physically healthy. And, and they had stated values that, that you, could, you could walk around the organization and see that they were posted somewhere, but they also lived. And when you or in an organization like that, you either resonate with what they're trying to accomplish, you understand it, certainly, or you leave because it doesn't fit with you. Yeah, and, and, and in my case, I often talk about what my role is, is to help you build your community of advocates. It's not about me. It's about what do I do for you? And how can I help your organization? Uh, because that's the whole reason that they would even want to be engaged and or, or hire me. I mean, it's not about me coming in, beating my chest and spouting off about, you know, how good I am uh, about something like that. Uh, and it made me think as you were saying it, because you were, you were making me visualize walking down the hall, uh, <laughs> which is great because that's storytelling and walking down the hall of a, of the Mercy Hospital and seeing these cues that are out there made me think about when, when we're face to face, we give off both verbal and nonverbal cues. Are there ways to correctly read the nonverbal cues? Well, absolutely. So Roger, right now, I'd like to give you a pat on the back for having such an excellent program. Okay, so, so I just gave you a virtual pat on the back that actually registered in your brain. So lots of research, especially that by a guy named Paul Zak, has proven that when we watch a movie, for instance, if we're watching James Bond 
and we're all together, let's say, let's say there are 30 of us in a movie theater and we're all being wired. Uh, our heart rate is being wired, our, our uh, skin, um, whatever it's called. Anyway, uh, it, it's, it's all the same. We're all in the same uh, physical situation because of that, we are mirroring that person. So, so if I said, here's a handshake, Roger, your brain is registering, probably registering the texture of my hand. Although obviously we're not doing it, but, but this is the way our brains work. We, we have these mirror neurons that if, if I'm in erect posture and I'm making good eye contact and I'm energized, I'm enthusiastic, then it's, it's going to make you feel that way. And I know, I know from you, Roger, that when you're on stage, you've got this energy ramped up, pumped up so high that the audience is also energized. And, you know, I always say to students, look, the audiences want you to succeed. They want you to be energized, relaxed, because if you aren't, they aren't because of this whole thing about mirror neurons. And, and on top of that, they want you to succeed because it's their time they're giving you. Exactly, exactly. You know, and, and part of the reason why, even though my podcasts are audio only, uh, part of the reason why I conduct the interviews through Zoom is my ability to be able to read what you're doing, what you're saying, uh, you're nodding right now, uh, your head up and down. That gives us uh, the, the cues back and forth to be able to make this a little bit more conversational rather than waiting uh, along the way. Exactly. You know, I, I've heard it said that we are to speak with an active voice. Uh, in your words, tell me what you think an active voice is. Uh -huh. Well, let me put it inside this context. So when when I'm teaching students to write better, I, I always say to them, look, when you write to an executive, that person wants to know, why did you write to me? What do you want me to do? And why should I care? So, okay. Now you should put all that in the subject line. So, you know, this person is busy. This person does, has little attention and is getting lots of messages and somehow calculating how important they are. So you need to grab them right away. And you need to, to show them what's called the bottom line up front or the bluff. So I'm constantly preaching on the bluff method. It's really, it really comes out of the military. So, so, you know, if you're in a foxhole and you're separated from the rest of the company and you're being shelled, you, you don't want to have some kind of inductive conversation with the guys back, uh, you know, at artillery. What you want to do is say, look, we're being overrun send the artillery right now, you know, give them the bottom line up front and you're likely to have a better communication with them for, for a variety of reasons. So I think I maybe lost the question, giving you the context. Oh, uh, uh, you know, an active voice. Okay. You, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yes. So, yes. So, so we have inside of our brain something called a process called processing fluency. That means, again, when we go back to our brains, they are, um, our brains are cognitive misers. They don't want to cogitate. They don't want to use their prefrontal cortex because it takes too much energy. So, so brains love what's called processing fluency. You're able to be very fluent. That's why we're constantly telling each other, don't say, uh, um, er, because those are called disfluencies and you, you start to bother the audience or even lose them. So active voice, of course, is more easily processed than passive voice. You have to stop and think about, about passive voice, about who's doing what here. So certainly whenever you're writing to somebody, you should prefer active voice. Promoting clarity. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to put you on the spot here, <laughs> but what would be some great questions to ask in the context of being in a meeting with elected officials and their, and their staff to 
to gauge the interest in supporting their ask. To go back to the to the way you were talking about asking questions. Yes, yes. So, so I'm going to go back to Julie Walker for a minute. So, Julie told a story, and that set the stage, of course, for her ask. So, Julie wants legislators and funders to support this idea of cardiac uh, intervention. And then she says to the audience, has your family ever been uh, affected by this? And if not, do you have a good friend that has been affected by this? Or, or find some way to, to enter into their world with a, uh, this bridge back to, to whatever the ask is. So I, I tell students all the time, and people that I consult with, look, ask again, what, how, and why. So you know, why would you not support this? What is in your um, wheelhouse right now that, that could be more important than this? And they are, I believe they're direct questions and they are perhaps even a little bit annoying, but I don't think it's a bad thing to do that. No, no. And, and one of them being, well, if you're not supporting it now, what would it take to gain your support? Absolutely, yes. Because absolutely. it's, again, an open-ended question rather than closed. Exactly. And we have caricatures of politicians, and unfortunately, they, they tend to, to dictate the way we perceive them and, and in some ways the way we interact with them but we have to be able to break them down and break them out of their own uh, self-imposed character as, as being a politician and being a person of self-importance and uh, I think that emotions authenticity and conversation this is the way to do that and and I want to use an example of plain language. We keep going back to Julie Walker. And one of the things, because she works, uh, what happened was a sudden cardiac arrest. And she said to me, you know, a heart attack is, comes from you having a plumbing issue in your body. Right. Sudden cardiac arrest comes when the power is shut off. And that plain language differentiates the two so distinctly and so clearly. And we get that because we all can relate to plumbing and we can all relate to power. Um, I, do a, I do a story where I talk about, uh, when, I, when I speak, when I talk about what a good lobbyist does. And I have the, you know, the five things a good lobbyist does, but I intertwine that with a story about my son once he got his driver's license wanting to get the car keys and take the car. And I parallel them back and forth. Okay, this is what a good lobbyist does. This is what my son wanted to do. This is what a good lobbyist does. This is what my son countered with. And I go back and forth and people come to me all the time and say, now I can relate to absolutely everything a lobbyist does because you put it in terms where we've all lived. Uh -huh, really? The other thing you did very nicely was use metaphorical language. So I have a uh, evaluation tool uh, for a, um, a practice we do called communicating complexity. So as you know, every discipline has its own jargon, its own technical specialized language, and it, it's no more, more troublesome, nowhere more troublesome than in, uh, in finance. So we have things that Markov process, martingales, all these terms that honestly, I don't understand. They're finance majors, not me. So, so anyway, we've been told by Wall Street, we've been told by our alums in the field that our students need to know how to communicate complexity. So we do that. And they must, must use a metaphor, an analogy, a simile, or a story to explain what is this thing you're talking about? 
We're also going to be talking about behavioral biases like anchoring and framing and priming and confirmation bias. And they must do the same thing. They must find a way to relate one concept to the other. And of course, we it's been said that we use metaphors every seven words or every seven seconds, I forget which. But but our language is replete with, with metaphor. Yeah. And and I then take it another step in, in, in advocacy training where I talk about breaking down the acronyms. People, uh, will go into, people will go into a meeting and start off with the ABCs of all the acronyms that are out there and eyes glaze over and, and people don't know that. And, and I try to put it in context to where people, when you go in to see an elected official, they know about an inch high and miles wide about all the issues that are out there. Another good metaphor. You walk, thank you. You walk in knowing a mile high and an inch wide about what you do. So you are more intelligent, more informed, more engaged, more motivated to be able to communicate that. So I'm trying to break down the fear, which leads me to this. Can you share any tips or techniques to keep people from getting lizard brain when they're meeting with elected officials, because we know fear is one of the things that happens when they go into these meetings. Maybe you should start by explaining to the audience what lizard brain is if they don't know. Well, uh, early in the uh, 20th century, or not not really, I'm sorry, later in the 20th century, uh, there was a uh, ne neurologist or a neuroscientist who, who suggested that, that we have a three-part brain, lizard brain, uh, the emotional brain and the neocortex that the, perhaps developed that exactly that way. Well, that, that's been um, disputed pretty hotly and pretty much set aside for the idea that our brain is, is a network. But given that we have these things in our brains called amygdala, amygdala, each one is an amygdala, and they're, they're almond shaped. That's where the name came from. And they are an emotional center and a fear center. So when something comes through our eyes, it goes to the back of our brain occipital load, goes from there to the thalamus, which is a, a kind of um, switchboard. And then that sends whatever this is to the amygdala and to the prefrontal cortex at the same time. So you're thinking about it, but you're emoting on it at the same time. And this just happens to everybody because our brain's function is to keep us alive and to help us reproduce. So, you know, we have, I'm going to flee, I'm going to fight, I'm, I'm going to run, or I'm going to uh, reproduce the, the four functions. And uh, so all this is going on in your brain and it's going on so fast that it's very difficult to control it. We end up we end up in an emotional state, and some people, with lots of training and practice, are able to control that. And you know, you can look at different politicians and say, "Wow, I can get to this one, man! I can really rattle his cage." And this this lady, not so much. And in fact, there are differences, sex differences between uh, how men and women handle these things because women, for instance, have, have um, more crossover uh, from the left, left side of their brain, left hemisphere to right hemisphere. You gave a great example with a little story earlier of I, I think what lizard brain is in a practical sense. You said, Roger, you walk out, you're in a parking lot, all of a sudden you see a shadow and you immediately kind of get into the either protective mode or fear mode or, 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 or whatever. And then all of a sudden, you know, you shout out, Hey, Roger. And now that goes away. So is that a good example of, of kind of what happens in, in, in that process? Absolutely. And <laughs> I'll tell you a personal story last night about, I think it was about 1230. We had gone to bed about 1030 and about 1230. I feel this 
shaking, shaking on my shoulder. My wife says, there's a bat in the room. So, so believe me, my amygdala, my fear center was on high alert. And so I, I crawled out of bed. I crawled along the floor. I was, I was trying to look for something that I could attack this poor bat with. And I uh, crawled out the door, actually, and went and got my son. And we went back in. I was armed with a pillow. He was armed with, a, with an old towel. We were going to get get this bat, and uh, I saw it. I saw it. It was hanging from the uh, from the curtains in our bedroom. And th- then the question is, okay, now, now now what do we do? So, but anyway, all three of us were in fear alert. <laughs> yeah, ab- absolutely. And 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 I had written about the fact that one of the reasons why people don't participate in advocacy is the inherent fear that they have before they get in there. You know, fear that I don't know enough, fear that they'll intimidate me, fear that uh, I'll, I'll stumble, I'll, you know, and, and that must happen because I know you work with people an awful lot on their interview process. That must happen in interviews as well. Well, it definitely does. And you've, I know you've heard of this uh, Harvard woman, Amy Cuddy, and her research on power posing. And I'm always saying that your brain influences your body and your body, of course, influences your brain. And Amy Cuddy's research said that power poses work. And I say to these people, look, get yourself in a, in a physical feeling that you have power and you have authority. And it's going to be reflected because either that or you reflect the other side or you reflect nothing. I had a conversation yesterday, Roger, with a an alum who is just turned 50 and hasn't had a job for for three years for a variety of reasons from Wall Street. And honestly, we Zoomed and he made no eye contact with me. He was actually leaning on his, uh, leaning his chin on his hand and his voice was so flat. After we had the conversation, I walked out into the kitchen and my wife said, boy, he sounded really depressed. So it was reflected in his voice, in his posture, in everything. And I didn't want to say something because it was our first meeting and I didn't want to add to his depression. (laughs) But somewhere along the line, if we continue, if I continue to coach him, we're going to have to cross that bridge. Well, that's the nonverbal cues that he was giving away. Absolutely. Absolutely. And they're, they're so powerful. That we we also of course talk about that in class to to a great extent. I ask everyone that comes on the show this question: What is the first thing that comes to mind when you think of advocacy? Wow, that's a great question. Well, the first thing that would come to my mind would be all the political experiences I've had. So, so I was the uh, campaign director for a guy named David Janetta, who who ran against a guy named Bob Jubilee. Bob Jubilee was a Republican uh, in Blair County. He was a Senate majority leader. He had been president of the Pennsylvania Young Republicans. He had a 20,000 voter registration edge. And and we lost to him by 800 votes. And it was the first time my brother-in-law ever ran for anything. And I, I just think back to when I moved to Pittsburgh and John Glenn, on a phone call, John Glenn had agreed to endorse David Janetta. So when I got to Pittsburgh, I called uh, John Glenn's headquarters and said, I want to run the, the Pittsburgh John Glenn for president campaign. And I go back to Bob Campbell, a guy in Altoona who ran for judge. And I go to all these campaigns, not the least of which, by the way, I'm I don't know to be proud or not, but I I actually worked for the committee to reelect the president, uh, which was a uh, Richard Nixon campaign that became very famous. So so when I think of advocacy, I I go to all those experiences I've had. That's great. Uh, And time flies. I mean, and and you've been such a great guest today. And I think you're going to prompt people to think uh, a little bit differently about the process of storytelling and how they get their advocates ready to do that. Uh, Do you have any final thoughts, anything you'd like to add? 
Wow. So I guess it's the idea that we consume fact-based arguments with our with our defenses in, in high gear. So so if you start throwing facts at somebody, you know, Julie Walker was so smart. She didn't walk in there with a fistful of facts. What she walked in with was a great story. And we could empathize with it. We saw change. The change occurred with Julie in a phone call. Her entire life changed. So, so she was in a crisis. And the word crisis is from an old Greek word, which means uh, both danger and opportunity, as, as the Chinese define it. But it also means turning point. So a story is a very important turning point. And of course, Julie Walker and her husband and family, their lives turned on one phone call and one incident. And this is what happens in our lives. So, so you know, we're not gonna criticize or be suspicious as much when, when we're absorbed and relaxed in a story. And we literally, we literally do relax and our critical functions decrease. So it's not that you're trying to trying to sell somebody something they don't need. We're not, we're not trying to hoodwink them. We just want them to relax so that they can not be defensive when listening to what it, whatever it is we're talking about. Oh, and, and, and that's where emotion comes in too. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah. So, so we are not thinking people who emote. We are emotional people who think. And we, we live much, much more in our emotions. And we live, some estimates say, 99% of our lives non-consciously. So if we're, if we're living most of our lives non-consciously, that means that our brains are kind of shut down. And when I say shut down, I mean that rational thinking executive prefrontal cortex is, is not in charge. We drive from here to there. We don't know how we did that when we got there. Okay, wow, that was interesting. How did I get here? Well, because you know nobody pulled out in front of you for you to, to grab your attention, for you to swear. And um, you know, just we just kind of live our lives that way. You know, I, I, I appreciate earlier when you said we, we didn't want to want to date this uh, this interview, but uh, as you were saying all this and you were talking and we're talking about perception, if we look at the stories that are unfolding currently in the world as far as, as conflict going on in Ukraine, we have a perception and an emotion that goes to what the leader of Ukraine is doing and how he's telling the story as opposed to the perception of the story of a man in Russia sitting at a long table away from people. And, and it's all those things that play into that. It's, it's just incredible that the world is full of competing stories. So we, we are absorbed in them all the time. Some people are, are, are absorbed in the Kardashians. I, I can't say that I'm one of those, and you know, other people are absorbed in um, whether or not uh, Tom Brady is going to be a commentator, or you know. So, but but they're all stories. Professor Barr, <laughs> how how can people get your books? Well, it's very easy. They just go to Amazon, and they're all three of them there. I've actually self-published a few, but these uh, three that I I wrote and published over COVID are on Amazon and they were published by Business Expert Press. And uh, the 101 tips was picked up by Harvard Business Publishing. So the ones that I self-published are Seven Secrets to Successful Business Writing and Seven Secrets to Successful Business Presentations. And uh, as you said earlier, I had my one uh, crack at uh, fiction as well. Yeah, w which I read and enjoyed. The, uh, and I like the fact that you go with the number seven because I wrote The Seven Actions of Highly Effective Advocates. 
Uh, so, so there must be something good in communicating the number seven. Well, there is. Uh, George Miller at Harvard published a paper called The Magic Number Seven, in which he demonstrated that some people could remember only five concepts at one time. Others could remember nine concepts at one time, but the majority in a bell curve could only remember seven concepts at one time. So of course, out of that comes uh, so many different things, seven wonders of the world and seven phone number digits and on and on and on. So you're right, Roger, we were onto something there. <laughs> That's great. Uh, how can people reach out to you if they'd like? I encourage anybody to reach out. They can do it through edbar at cmu.edu, just E-D-B-A-R-R -R at cmu.edu by email. And then we can get together. Otherwise, I have to tell you that given my advancing age, my daughter- Don't bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we won't, we won't talk about the time when I was teaching you in seventh grade. But- <laughs> My daughter, uh, who's a consultant in Colorado Springs for the Center for Creative Leadership, got very active on TikTok and she said, Dad, you need to do this. So I actually did. I've been on four months and I have almost 100,000 followers. So I, I decided that what I'm going to do is just share whatever I know on this platform that has over a billion users. Uh, lots of it, of course, is stuff that you don't want to watch, but business is taking a much greater interest now on TikTok. So I'm on there at EdBar2 or the word pro bar, as in pro Professor Bar. And uh, of course, I'm also on LinkedIn and Facebook. And I love connecting with new people, meeting new people, learning about new people. So, Roger, thank you for for asking me that question. Sir, uh, it has been an extreme pleasure. Uh, I can't thank you enough for helping uh, the listeners of our show better understand the importance of storytelling, the ability to communicate, uh, the way that you communicate has always been so warm and welcoming. And that was shown by just the way that you've wrapped up today's wonderful conversation with Professor Ed Barr of Carnegie Mellon University. Thank you, Ed, for being on today's show. And from my heart, I wish you all the best. Thank you so much, Roger. It's been a pleasure. Let's face it, today's advocacy arena is just plain noisy. Organizations are stretched. You need every advantage to make sure your issue gets the attention it deserves and your voice heard. The RAP Index is the best way to do just that by finding your stakeholders' relationships and engagement power. Get past the noise. Know who your people know. Go to rapindex.com. That's R-A-P-Index.com and tell them Roger sent you for a special offer. If you like today's podcast, head over to where you find your podcast and subscribe to the Voices in Advocacy podcast. A big thank you to today's guest. I appreciate your time and the unwavering passion for advocacy you have. Well, that's it for this episode of Voices in Advocacy. Remember, you have the power to be an effective, influential advocate. Now go out and make it a better world. We hope you enjoyed today's Voices in Advocacy podcast and look forward to you joining us again next week. To learn more about Voices in Advocacy, go to our website, voicesinadvocacy.com.